Good evening, everybody. Uh, I hope you can hear me. Uh, it's, a, it's already four minutes past six o'clock, and I suppose we can begin now. I can see we have a good enough quorum. So probably you can ask uh, anyone else who was intending to log in. They can log in now. We are going to build start now. So once again, good evening or good morning or good afternoon, uh, everyone. And I'm delighted to welcome you all to this uh, event today. Uh, I know you may be logging from any, uh, many parts of the globe. You're all welcome. I also want to thank Novartis for sponsoring this event today. And my name is uh, Dr. Timo Dimoreti. I'll moderate this uh, uh, session for you. And we will discuss a crucially important um, and often difficult topic, uh, that is uh, uh, acute pain management in children. And I'm sure uh, we are all eagerly waiting to, to learn more and um, share also uh, about our experiences in this uh, regard. So a few keeping rules, uh, keep your uh, mics muted and uh, probably you should also uh, switch off your videos unless of course you're, you're a speaker or you're speaking. And then uh, use the chat function uh, to communicate and also you can put your questions there. So for the program today, we'll start with a presentation from our presenter today, uh, Dr. Nancy Okun, who talk to us about the acute, uh, acute pain management in pediatric patients. And then uh, I might call on a, a, few, a few specialists here and there to give us some few insights. Immediately after, I will um, open the floor for question and answers. So I think we are ready to hear from Nan Dr. Nancy Okonu. And Dr. Nancy Okonu, uh, there are many things I can say about her, but uh, a few, uh, she's a pediatric anesthesiologist based at the Kenyatta National Hospital here in Nairobi. And she has an extensive experience in dealing with the uh, surgical pediatric patients, especially those ones with severe uh, or life-threatening conditions that require surgery. And so she's well versed with the post-operative management or rather perioperative management of these patients. And this often includes uh, optimizing their pain uh, control. Uh, other than that, I know Nancy, is, uh, she's keen on uh, uh, generating knowledge and sharing. And uh, to that end, she's very helpful in supervision of dissertations and uh, contributing that uh, in, in, the, in that uh, part of knowledge uh, generation. She's also a very able uh, clinical instructor. So without spending too much time, uh, Dr. Kono, uh, I will uh, welcome you to give us your presentation now. Dr. Kono. Uh, good evening, everyone. I hope I'm audible. Yes, we can hear you. So as, thank you for that introduction, Dr. Miti. Uh, so as you've heard, I'm uh, Dr. Nancy Okomo, and uh, I'm a pediatric anesthesiologist. I work in Kenyatta Hospital. So we're going to spend the next uh, few minutes uh, talking about acute management of uh, pain in children. So the objectives of this talk is uh, we are going to look at pain definition we're going to look at the different the types of pain uh, in children. We're also going to look at the pediatric pain assessment tools and uh, that are age appropriate. We'll also discuss a bit on medications used for pain treatment in children. And uh, thereafter, we'll look at a few special considerations for pain treatment in children. So uh, I'll start off. Uh, with the definition of pain. So what is pain? We all have come across this definition. It's not new. And uh, it's, uh, it's the first definition of pain was uh, done by the International Association for the Study of Pain back in 1979. And this was devised after 40 years uh, in 2019. And now we have a new one for 2020. So uh, pain basically is an unpleasant sensory an emotional experience associated with or resembling that associated with actual or potential tissue damage, which is very similar to the initial uh, uh, definition of pain, which was an 
Please send sensory and emotional experience arising from actual or potential tissue damage or described in terms of such things. So the big difference between the initial definition and the definition we have now, if you look at the last, uh, the last few words described in terms of such damage, they are not there in the new definition. Meaning, a patient doesn't have to describe, doesn't have to talk to, for us to be able to know that there is pain. So pain is not necessarily a bad thing. It is a protective uh, mechanism for adaptive, for adapting to the environment. When you are injured, the brain tells you remove that hand. Let's say your hand is burning, you move it. Then if you injure it again, you feel pain. The brain reminding you that that hand is still injured. It needs to be protected until it heals. But sometimes if, I mean, if, as much as it's an adaptive, sometimes an adaptive method for us to survive and not injure ourselves, sometimes its effects on, can be on function, can have uh, uh, effects on function, can have effects on social as well as psychological well-being. So that is the part, the part that we need to treat and we need to talk about. So uh, there are different classifications of pain. Pain is classified mainly as acute and chronic. And the acute pain is what we're talking about being protective pain. Chronic pain is not protective per se. It's, uh, acute pain is usually related to anatomical injury. You can actually see that this, this, uh, uh, this tumor is broken. You can be able to see the anatomical injury. Whereas chronic pain is basically related to a neuronal complex. In terms of duration, acute pain is self-limited. It tends to resolve as soon as the tissue is healed. Whereas chronic pain continues beyond the time frame expected for the tissues to heal. In terms of treatment, acute pain usually medications and conservative management and both non-pharmacological and non-pharmacological methods, you are able to uh, sort out the acute pain. Whereas for chronic pain, it requires more extensive treatment, multiple modes of therapy, on medication, physiotherapy, psychological therapy, and all that. So physiologically, acute pain is also uh, uh, looked at in terms of uh, the types of pain can be true, where there's receptive pain or neuropathic pain. The receptive pain is uh, the kind of pain that uh, is associated with uh, uh, injury, and it's uh, it can be somatic or it can be uh, visceral pain. The somatic pain is usually transmitted by adductor fibers, which are myelinated fibers, they're fast fibers. It's the first pain that you feel that wants your main tendon, and it tends to be localized and it's very sharp pain. You're able to tell this fever is broken, this part of the body is actually injured and is a cut. Whereas visceral pain is uh, transmitted by C fibers, which are unmyelinated myelinated fibers. They are slow fibers and it's poorly localized pain. It tends to be associated with tissue injuries, either from inflammation, detention, or whatnot. Whereas neuropathic pain is associated, it's due to lesion or disease of somatosensory nervous system and it can be peripheral or central. We can also have mixed pain where you have a mixture of these two components, nociceptive as well as neuropathic pain, like what we see in cancer patients. It can be a mixture of both. So, on to the pediatric pain. So, why is uh, pediatric pain under treated? Uh, the task force by the American uh, Academy of Pediatrics done an old paper back in 2001, task, task force on pain in infants, children, and adolescents came up with these reasons as to why pediatric pain is under treatment. There is a belief that children, especially infants, do not feel pain the way adults do, which is not really true. And there's also, there was lack of uh, uh, routine pain assessment in children, so probably they were not able to detect that a child is in pain, especially the ones who might not be able to speak. Lack of knowledge in pain treatment was another factor, and there was also the fear of adverse effects of analgesics, especially when you're dealing with opioid. Uh, adverse effects like respiratory depression, others fear the risk of addiction in children, which is much less than we know in children. Believe that uh, preventing pain in children takes a bit too much time and too much effort, 
and parental understanding of pain also played a factor. If a parent doesn't believe that a child is in pain, they probably will not seek treatment. Then personal beliefs and, uh, uh, and values. The pain builds character. If a child believes that, they must not even report that they are in pain. So historically, children and infants have received post, uh, a less post-operative analgesia. Even for us, when we look at the treatment is for adults, they have all sorts of analgesics. But when you come to a neonate, they probably have paracetamol and that is it. So we, uh, we know that from various studies, neonates can experience pain by as early as 24 weeks to 36 weeks. They have mature afferent pain transmission. If there's an, uh, an obstetric stimulus on a, a limb of a, a fetal at 24 weeks, they'll be able to withdraw that limb, meaning they have mature afferent pain transmission. What is known also from the various studies is that they have poorly developed descending pathways. When you have poorly developed descending pathways, this means that these are the pathways that modulate pain, that they have an influence on the kind of pain that uh, a person is going to feel. So when they are poorly developed, then they probably, then it could mean that actually the very young children who have dev poorly developed descending pathways could be at even risk of feeling much more pain than the older child than an adult. Another old study done in 1997 by Sadio et al. This study, they were looking at uh, circumcised uh, children, and uh, circumcised children. Children, uh, there were neonates who were circumcised at birth. They followed them up up to six months, and they took videos every time they went for uh, vaccination. So every time they were vaccinated, they took videos, and these videos were passed on to blinded uh, of independent observers to be able to do the distress scores and pain scores. And uh, what came out of that study was that the, the, the children who were circumcised as neonates uh, actually had much higher distress scores and much higher pain scores as opposed to the ones who are not circumcised. And then for the group that was circumcised, there was a group that was given painkillers, either a local anesthesia creams or a local infiltration. And there was the other group that was not given any pain control. So the ones who are not given any pain control medication during circumcision actually had higher pain scores as well as higher distress scores. So what came out of this study is that untreated pain in your legs can actually lead to increased distress and altered pain response in the future. So telling us that we need to treat pain in neonates as well. So why treat pain? Again, we're saying severe pain causes extreme discomfort and suffering. It also to add treated pain also causes harmful physiological effects. When you look at the pulmonary system, you reduce flow because they're not able to breathe well, they're in pain. Volumes are reduced, there's a lot of epilepsis, there's a lot of shunting that end up with the even desaturation. In the cardiovascular system, we see high heart rates, cardiac outputs, and uh, even increased systemic vascular resistance and an increased workload from the heart. This might not be a big problem on a healthy child as opposed to maybe adults who have other comorbidities or increased cardiovascular risks. But we also have children who have cardiac issues. So if their pain is not well controlled, you can actually end up with bigger problems. We also know that pain can depress, depress the immunity and in the endocrine system, we have elevated stress levels. So causes of acute pain in children, generally any acute illness like pneumonia can be with pain. Procedural pain is very common in our children, especially when admitted in hospitals. Surgical pain and post operative pain, post surgical pain. Then you could also have children who already have chronic pain, then you have exacerbations of chronic pain. We are going to look at a few cases at the end of this. Uh, one, uh, case one. Is you have a three year old uh, child with a one or higher repair. The second case is a six month old with six kilos as a one coming in for ureteral reinfestation. Case three, we look at a five year old child, 1.8 kilos preterm of 32 weeks who presented for thoracotomy for uh, TEF repair, the tracheoesophageal repair. Then case four is an eight-year-old, 18 kg child with cerebral palsy who has severe cognitive impairment as a class three coming in for femoral osteotomy. 
we'll look at these cases and see how we manage them differently at the end of the presentation. So general principles of pain management in children, you need to anticipate and prevent pain, adequately assess pain, use a multimodal approach, involve parents. When you're dealing with children, parents have to be on the picture. from the beginning to the end. Then it's also important to use non-noxious roots. So no, I, no uh, I am and subcutaneous roots in children. We're going to look at how to measure pain uh, in children. So we have different pain scales that are used to be able to measure pain in children. We know that pain is the fifth vital sign and it's been like that for several years. It is assessed just like we assess heart rate, we assess respiratory rate, temperature, uh, as well as uh, blood pressure and intervene. So pain should also be assessed every time we assess all these other vital signs. And the gold standard tool for assessing pain is a self-reporting tool. So there are several tools that have been validated for children and adopted for use, and they actually rely the tools to use in the measurement of pain in children. The one, the, the one I've said is a self-reporting tool is the gold standard. This is for older children who can be able to express themselves. So when they say they're in pain and they're able to uh, measure their pain on a scale and tell you how they're feeling, then we take it on the case. We also have behavioral tools as well as physiological tools. Physiological tools per se are not on their own. They are physiological parameters that have been incorporated in behavioral tools. So these two are also known as uh, of you as a healthcare worker, observe the child, record these parameters, and then at the end of the day, come up with a score. So how do you decide which tool or which scale to use? Mainly it's determined by the age of the child, as well as the cognitive ability of the child. So for the non-verbial child, like the children who are pre-verbial, they have not learned how to speak, then we assess their behaviors. But for school-aged children and adolescents who already know how to speak, who are cognitively intact and they're able to speak out and assess themselves, then we use the self-reporting tools. And the importance of this is that you also need, you use the skill before, assess the pain, then after intervention, you should also be able to assess that and see if it has worked or it has not worked. So yeah, we look at the different age groups and their age-appropriate tools for those age groups. Assessment in neonates and infants can be a bit more challenging for all the age groups. But it, com it combines physiological as well as uh, behavioral parameters. There are many scales that are available. We don't have to know all this. We don't have to remember all of them. We pick one and adopt it for the hospitals and use it so that everyone is familiar with what they're using. So the first one is the neonatal infant pain scale. It's the FLAC scale, which is uh, basically stands for face, legs, activity, cry, and concernability. There's another one called Thrice. There's another one called Comfort, mainly used for children admitted in the ICU or who are intubated. Then there's NPAT and uh, there is the PIP, which is premature infant pain profile. The commonly used ones are the first one, which is neonatal infant pain scale, as well as the second one, which is the FLAC scale. So in this age group, we are looking at the NIMS, which is the neonatal infant pain scale. It is valid from 25 weeks, that's for preterm children, and it can be used all the way to one year for assessment of acute as well as procedural pain. The pain score, usually you look at all these parameters, looking at the facial expression, the cry, the breathing pattern, how are the arms, how are the legs, the state of arousal for the child, the heart rate, the differences from the baseline, and the oxygen saturation. Then you add all these values together and come up with a value. So if you have a value 0 to 3, that is probably mild pain. If you have 4 to 6, it's moderate pain, and beyond 7 is severe pain. So for, for NIPS, when it is mild, you can use the uh, other than pharmacological means of uh, treating pain, like uh, just feeding the child, cuddling them, and uh, uh, just feeding them and also swaddling them to be able to make them more comfortable. But if it goes to moderate, then you might need to add uh, other uh, pharmacological uh, means of treating them. So the next one is the flux scale. 
which is used in uh, older children, uh, the toddlers, flat scale. Then there's another one called JOPS, and uh, this is Children Hospital Eastern Ontario, a pain score. And there's another one called OAPS, which is Objective Pain Scale. So this, uh, of, of this age group of toddlers, the flat scale is the commonly used one. So flat basically stands for face, leg, activity, cry, and consolability. All this, it's, it's an acronym for all this. Uh, and it makes it even easy to remember. It's also used for acute and post-operative pain management. I mean, pain assessment. It's valid from the age of two months up to five years. And it's also used for children who are not babble, the cognitively impaired children as well. But the one for cognitively impaired children is called, it has a, an R at the beginning. So it is a revised flag scale. Because there are things that in a cognitively impaired child, especially children with cerebral palsy, their motor function might be impaired. So their leg activity and, activity and postures might not be like a normal child. So their flag scale has been modified a little bit to be able to fit, uh, to fit into using for uh, children who have uh, cognitive impairment. So again, for flat, we look at the face and score, we look at the legs and score, then activity, cry, and responsibility. Then uh, come up with the score. So if it's zero to three, it's mild pain. If it's four to six, it's well moderate, and beyond seven, it's severe. Then we have a group of uh, six to eight years. In this group, the faces pain scale is the common used. We have another one called Bokachik School, most commonly used but color pain scales are also used. So when you look at these faces, the faces are usually six. This is the original one, the Baker scale. It has a, a, a face which is smiling here. At this, it's zero. Then the last face uh, is, uh, is at 10, which is severe pain. This has been modified to the lower scale, which has a neutral face, that the, the child here is not smiling like the other one. It's been the initial one was shown that it was actually over, uh, over how do I say it? It, it, was, it was increasing the pain score because sometimes a child who is not who is might not have pain, but they will they, they have another distress that is causing them to be uncomfortable. They will not speak a smiling face because they are not happy, but they'll be able to, that um, overscores the pain that they have. So it's been revised and we use the neutral face. So in this age group, uh, this is the the revised one which I've just shown you is what is common use and the child is asked to just pick the face that they think corresponds to their kind of pain. So once they pick, then you take that number that is below. Then above eight years and adolescence, these are children who are who can be able to express themselves. They are in school, they understand uh, numbers, they are able to serialize numbers. They know two is smaller than 10 and they can be able to score themselves using the numeric rating scales. They can also use the visual analog scales, even color paint scales can be used in this age group. Uh, so the, the numeric rating scale can be vertical or horizontal. So you ask the child to be able to break their pain from zero to 10, and they are able to pick out a number, and then you are able to actually get them compared to what they have picked. So, uh, that aside for uh, rating pain, yeah? what I want to say is that we don't have to know all these uh, uh, methods of rating pain in children, but we pick one for each and every age group and adopt it, and that becomes easier that we all speak from the same uh, uh, language. So sometimes just using pain scales, there have also been uh, thought to oversimplify pain. They may and they may not. Sometimes they are actually very reliable, but also there are children who fear. If they score nine, you want to know, is that pain tolerable? If a child says their pain is nine, is it really tolerable? And then you find it is, they're saying it's tolerable, then it might not be true. So you have to, for us to holistically assess pain, we have to also incorporate other factors. In addition to using the pain scales, you also want to see how is the nursing report, how is the parents' report in terms of pain for this child, and how is the self-report, for those who are able to self-report, you can 
as well countercheck with the behavioral tools to be able to uh, objectively assess this pain. So on to the management of pain. So after we've assessed the pain, what next? So we need to manage it. So we have the multimodal approach. Multimodal approach can be pharmacological or non-pharmacological. For children, non-pharmacological methods also work very well. They work very well, like having parents around, using them to distract the child when you're doing IV cannulation or when you're drawing blood using imagery, using hypnosis, massage, all these things, art and play, they also work very well for mild pain. So then pharmacological therapy for more uh, severe pain, or moderate to severe pain, even for mild pain as well. So the WHO uh, has principles for pediatric acute pain management, and one of the big principles is that when we are managing pain in children, it needs to be by the clock with the child and by the appropriate route. By the clock, what do we mean? It means that we do not do PRN dosing. We, if a child is in mild or moderate pain and you think that they require to be given a drug, then we need to do regular scheduling to ensure that we have a steady blood level to be able to control that pain. Because when you prescribe PRN dosing, then it means that this child either gets nothing or gets very little. And they, so basically, you are not managing your pain. With a child, it means that we individualize the, the pain management, assess the child, give uh, medication, and also modify your prescription, depending on how the child is responding. Then we need also to use the appropriate routes in uh, when we are giving the painkillers. So uh, pharmacological treatment, there are various drugs that are used for treating pain. One is the NSAIDs, we also use uh, paracetamol. Paracetamol is the, 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 the commonest drug prescribed for children with low So these drugs work at different levels and they are able to complement each other, they are synergistic. So like for the local anesthetic agents and anti-inflammatory drugs like uh, NSAIDs will work at the peripheral nerve endings. The local anesthetic agents will also work on the, the, the nerves that are actually taking the, the, the impulse to the uh, spinal cord. The local anesthetic agents and uh, alpha-2 uh, adrenoceptors will also work at the spinal cord level. Opioids, the alpha-2 adrenal Sector agonists will also work at the brain level to be able to reduce the pain experience. So, pharmacological treatment of uh, moderate to severe pain, we still go back to the WHO uh, ladder for pain. This ladder for pain, initially we know was designated for use in cancer patients, but it's being applied for all types of uh, pain in patients. So, the initial step is mild pain. In this, it's recommended to use an opioid plus or minus an adjuvant. In all stages, add an adjuvant. For moderate pain, uh, you can add an opioid as needed, as a period, but have around the clock an opioid, either an NSAID or a paracetamol plus an adjuvant. If in severe pain management, you want to have a scheduled opioid around the clock, okay, as well as a, an opioid or two an opioids, an NSAID, as well as a paracetamol plus or minus an adjuvant. So we are still insisting that you need to consider shedding pain medication for children who have active ongoing pain process, like after surgery. You can you don't do PRN dosing, always have around the clock medication. Uh, acetaminophen acetamin is what we commonly call paracetamol and NSAIDs. As I've said, are used for mild to moderate pain, but they still form part of the uh, multimodal pain uh, management, even in severe pain. Morphine is used for uh, moderate to severe pain. The initial WHO ladder for pain, pain for day and tramadol, which have been taken off and they are being discouraged for use in children. We'll talk about that briefly in the, near, in the next few slides. So one of the commonest drugs that we use is NSAID. We know how NSAIDs work. They inhibit cyclooxygenase 
and prevent formation of prostaglandins. These are part of the inflammatory mediators that actually cause pain. They could act peripherally and they may also have some central analgesic effect. Caution with NSAIDs in children, you avoid them in less than six month olds because of the mature renal uh, function. Because we know that uh, prostaglandins are usually vasodilatory and they increase blood flow to the kidneys. So when you block prostaglandins from being formed, then you reduce blood flow to the kidneys. And this can actually put the kidneys in danger, especially in children who are already hypovolemic or who are, who are losing blood. Then in say, this might not be a good drug to give in such patients. Then we also have to remember the other uh, side effects for which is uh, they can increase bleeding. Uh, they also have effects on the, uh, the GIT where they can actually, once you remove the, uh, the prostaglandin, there is, uh, you remove the protective layer of the, 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 the stomach and you are predisposed to ulcers uh, and even bleeding in the GIT. The other concern for NSAIDs, in the, especially in the post operative period, is for there's a risk. Uh, there has been, it's been controversial that they, it's been thought that they could actually affect the osteogenesis. Prostaglandins form a big factor when it comes to bone formation, and there's been a concern that if you give NSAIDs that will block formation of prostaglandins, there's a risk of non union. But uh, it, the verdict is that if you use NSAIDs for a short duration and the lowest dose and the shortest duration, then the effect on the bone is not significant. So these are the commonest NSAIDs we have, naproxen, we have ibuprofen, uh, the dose is between 5 and 10 milligrams per kilo. Ibuprofen can be used for less, uh, for the, from 3 months of age as opposed to all the other insects, which we can only use from six months. It can be given orally. But if you're using for the less than three months of age, then you need to use the lower dose of five milligrams per kilo. Then beyond six months, then you can use the 10 milligrams per kilo. You also have ketoprofen, which can be given orally as well as parenterally. We have the clopenac, uh, which you use at one milligram per kilo. It can be given orally. It's also very crucial uh, for us, especially in the post op period, or even in theater, because we can use it as a, uh, as a suppository. We also have Ketorola, which can also be given as 0.5 milligrams per day. So the thing about NSAIDs, is not just in children, but generally, they have a ceiling effect. So beyond some dose, you can not increase the action on pain. You can only worsen the side effects. So NSAIDs also, con they are the cornerstone of pulse model approach. Yeah, you use NSAIDs from, from mild pain all the way to severe pain. But caution, you should only use beyond six months, but you will prove that you use at three months. The thing with NSAIDs in children, use the lowest dose at the shortest time possible. We also look at paracetamol, which is an, an analgesic as well as antibiotic. We know it works by uh, inhibiting prostaglandin uh, synthesis. It has no adverse effect on platelets or the gastric mucosa like NSAIDs do. And they are metabolized in the liver, in the liver, sorry, available orally, parietal, and IV roads. The dose usually would be about uh, 10 to 15 milligrams per kg per dose, and it can be given up to one, to one gram every four every four to six hours. The one gram is uh, for older children. Maximum daily dose is recommended at 75 milligrams. The thing with the paracetamol, when we look at the smaller children, like the three terms, then you reduce the dose. We cannot do the 15 milligrams. For the three terms, less than 32 weeks, we do 7.5 milligrams per kg, and it's given eight hour day. But between 32 to about one month, 44 weeks, uh, then you can do 7.5 milligrams, but this is given six hourly. For the infant who is uh, more than a month, all the way up to one year, then you use 10 milligrams per kilo. And for the older child, you can now use uh, 15 milligrams per kilo. Of mention of uh, note, it's when you're using rectal paracetamol, the dose is usually higher 
we don't want to take low carbs per kilo, especially the loading dose. It's recommended you start at 40 mg per kilo, then thereafter you can use 20 or less milligrams per kilo, as long as you do not go beyond the recommended daily dose. And uh, in some cases, uh, rectal paracetamol has also been shown to actually act longer, probably because of the slow absorption. And also the other problem with the rectal is that it was erratic absorption, but it's also a good uh, approach to use when you don't have the IV preparation. So uh, the major side effect of paracetamol is mainly toxicity, but this is not usually seen. It's a very safe drug with a very safe, uh, safety, uh, a very good safety profile. But unless you use high doses consistently for several days, that's probably when you might start worrying about the toxicity. In terms of how long to use it for, no guidelines to limit the length of time, but you need to be cautious if you've been keeping it continuously for over 10 to 14 days, especially the very small children, then you you might start getting more. Of, uh, I wanted to also mention that we have a lot of uh, opioid acetamine opioid, or opioid paracetamol mixtures like uh, you get uh, oxycodone plus paracetamol. When you're using this kind of mixtures, you need to be careful, especially if you're trying to optimize the dose for uh, the opioid. It's so easy to find yourself giving much more paracetamol beyond the required dose. So if you are managing severe pain, it's better to prescribe this uh, drugs as separate entities, not using mixtures, so that you do not uh, go beyond the safe limits for each of the drugs. In addition to that, I wanted to say that if you are using suppositories, it is not recommended to divide suppositories. Like you have a child who needs, uh, let's say you have a 12 milligram uh, suppository and you want to cut it to six milligrams. If you need to, it's because when you cut it, you do not know, you cannot tell how much drug you're giving or which side it is. So it's not recommended to divide suppositories. We move on to opiates. We know opiates are derived from opium. The actons are the mu receptors, the kappa receptors, the sigma receptors, all those the opioid receptors. And they're the most effective drugs for uh, management of severe pain. Uh, we know the side effects of opiates, sedation, respiratory depression, yeah, uh, uh, delayed the motility. We have a lot of constipation every time you put a patient on opioids. There is pruritus, urine retention, especially if you're using them in the uh, as in the neurotic neuro blocks. You can also get opioid induced hyperalgesia. There is a risk of tolerance as well as uh, dependence. So this is much less for children. Every time you're using opioids, especially the IV opioids, uh, you need to even oral. You need to, but when you use the IV opioids, then your vigilance needs to be higher. Use the pulse oximeter, monitor your saturation, monitor the respiratory rate. You need to monitor the sedation scores as well as uh, this is recommended for safety. So just go back on uh, morphine. It's usually the commonest uh, used uh, uh, opioid um, in children. It can be given orally. The oral syrups for children it can be given subliquely, subcutaneous, IV, rectal. It's a very versatile a drug that you can give in all these loads, mainly used for moderate to severe pain. And it's the drug against which all these other opioids uh, potency is compared to. Uh, the bolus for IV dose is usually 0 0.05 to 0 0.2 milligrams per kg every four hours on a full day. So uh, when you're dealing with neonatal the creatures, they tend to have slow excretion, so you need to reduce the dose. And what is recommended, especially in the less than three months, by usually by around three months, you are able to excrete uh, morphine. But uh, if you're giving morphine in the less than three months or in the three terms, then you need to give the lowest dose possible. And in this age group, we recommend the 25 micrograms per kg to the maximum of 50 micrograms per kg. In the critically ill and also children who have obstructive sleep apnea, you also need to reduce the dose. Remember, uh, morphine has active metabolites that may accumulate if you're giving them to a child who has renal dysfunction. So the other opiates that are commonly used is hydromorphone, ethanol, as well as oxycodone. Hydromorphone is mainly used also for, it's a very uh, potent uh, uh, opiate 
actually five to seven times uh, more potent than morphine. And when it's available, it can be used for IV infusion for patients or children who cannot be able to uh, who have too many side effects uh, when they are on morphine. So it is uh, and it doesn't also have active metabolites. Fentanyl has also been used. This I think is one of the commonest drugs we use also either in theater or even in uh, post mortem as well. But most common in theater, it's very potent, over a hundred times uh, more potent than morphine. And uh, it can also be given at a dose of 0.5 to 1 like per kg. It can, it, it, it's also you it can be given through all these routes. It's also very versatile. Though the transdermal part is not used for acute pain, it's mainly for, uh, for chronic pain management. It can be given AB for those angels are uh, free of as well. Oxycodone is also used uh, the, the several formulations, the immediate release as well as extended release. Extended release is mainly for chronic pain, but the immediate release is used for uh, uh, acute pain. And it, it's also found uh, as a combination with the paracetamol. It's excreted in the kidneys. So if you have renal dysfunction, you need to remove the dose. Now, off to, we need to look at uh, codeine and tramadol. These are drugs that we've used for a long time, but most hospitals have taken them off their uh, formula. And one of the reasons is that one, codeine is a prodrug metabolized to morphine by the cytochrome P450 system, specifically the site 2D6. And uh, there are patients who, are, who can be ultra metabolizers, about 10% of the population. Can be ultra metabolizers, and some countries actually even have a higher rate. And if you have an ultra rapid metabolizer, that means that they break codeine so fast and end up with so much morphine and end up with a, the risk is an overdose. So, and then you have the under metabolizers, the ones who cannot metabolize codeine to morphine. Then, for this particular group of patients, they lack analgesia. You give them codeine, but you're not giving them any analgesia because they do not have the capability of metabolizing it to the active compound that's going to give them analgesia. So FDA black box warnings back from 2015, codeine should not be used uh, in children, uh, especially for post op management of children, post tonsillectomy or post adenoidectomy. Treating pain, it should not also be used to treat pain for any child with less than 12 years, and it should not also be used to treat pain in children between 12 and 18 years who are obese or who have obstructive sleep apnea. It even went further to say that even uh, breastfeeding mothers should not use codeine. This was also extended to tramadol. Tramadol uh, is also metabolized, it's also a prodrug, it's metabolized to desmethyl uh, tramadol which acts on the new receptors and it's actually over 200 times more potent than the initial drug. So uh, there is also, it's also metabolized through the same system, cytochrome K450, and there is a risk that if for the patients or for the children who are ultra metabolizers, they can easily uh, metabolize it into the metabolizer for this metal tramadol, which has is highly potent and can easily cause an overdose. Several cases, a few cases of death, as well as the near misses, have been described. And this informed the reason why FDA removed these two drugs from uh, 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 gave up a, a, a black box warning, and most hospitals are not using it so much. Uh, so, again, on opioids. Usually we know that we use them orally for moderate uh, pain if a child is able to take orally. But for those who cannot be able to, to take orally, then you can give IV intermittent bonuses. If you have an infusion pump, then you can give IV continuous infusions. The first line for giving IV continuous infusions is uh, morphine. If uh, a child cannot tolerate morphine, you can also give fentanyl or you can give hydromorphine. The best way to give uh, opioids in a child who has severe pain, severe constant pain, which cannot be adequately controlled using these other methods would also be using 
a patient controlled analgesia pca method or nurse controlled analgesia so for the pca if the child has a pump and it's a program the pump is programmed it allows the patient to be able to control the intravenous analgesia so they can choose when to deliver a dose by pressing on a button uh, so it is uh, it is it's a safe method as long as it's done correctly. There have to be protocols in place. You have to have the right pump. You must have uh, training for all the healthcare workers working in that institution or managing those children. They must know how to deal with the, the, the pump, how to set it properly, the right prescriptions. So before you can be able to use this kind of uh, uh, tools or PCA, you must have the right infrastructure in place. It is uh, inherently safe to use a PCA because if a child is oversedated, then they are unlikely to administer too much drug. But teaching is integral, not just to the healthcare workers, but also to the family, the parents, so that they do not press the pump. It is supposed to be patient controlled, not parent controlled. For severe constant pain, it's used, especially for sovereign pain, or even sickle cell disease, or even cancer patients. And uh, the age group for using PCA in children is more than eight years. But between six and eight years, those ones who, are, who, who, who can be able to use a pump are assessed and they can be allowed to use it even if they're six years. And one of the, the, the things that the, they look at is if those children who are able to play video games, they know how to press these buttons. And if a child is motivated to use, if the parents are supportive and they, are, and they agree to that, then such children between six to eight years can be allowed but generally it's allowed for use beyond eight years for the less than six years then we do not use patient control analgesia we use nca which is nurse control analgesia and in a few cases the c here cca is a caregiver control analgesia rarely used uh, probably sometimes for cancer patients chronic pain and uh, that's when it's allowed but the parents have to undergo through uh, a lot of training in terms of safety. So when you look at patient control analgesia, the main, the main things that are said is the loading dose. So the initial dose that's given uh, to, so that you have uh, a certain level of uh, concentration of the drug in the blood. Then there's a the basal infusion rate. This can be given or might not need to be given. There is controversy on this. So it's not always given if you are doing proper patient control analgesia. Then the, you also set the patient's demand dose as well as the local interval, which is usually five to ten minutes. And this local interval prevents a second PCA dose uh, from being given before the previous uh, bolus has taken effect. Then you also need to set the maximum hourly limit that can be uh, either hourly or four hourly. So depending on how much you want to give in four hours or so one hour, you set that from the word go. So back to the basal infusion rate. The pros and cons of giving a basal infusion rate. So it's when you look at these these two graphs, uh, there, there are three graphs on the right side. Uh, so the first one is a from a PCA without uh, a basal infusion rate. So what happens? The child uh, presses the button. It gives a bolus, and uh, the the rate the, the concentration of the drug increases in the blood. Uh, and it's able to provide analgesia. So the lower side is pain, the upper side is echoventilation. You want to be along this line of analgesia. So when they press, it, the dose in, it increases the concentration of the drug in the, in the blood. Then with time, it starts waning again. So after some time again, they press and it decreases. So that is how it works. And it's actually very safe. You do not want to get to the, to the hypoventilation line up here. But what happens if a child slips on the second graph? It shows that this child uh, pressed the, the, the pump, uh, with that it, then a dose was delivered, but then they fell asleep. So the, the, the concentration of the drug in the blood has been going down. When they wake up, they're in pain and they start pushing. When they push up the, the, the button, a uh, dose is delivered, but it does not give them analgesia because the blood concentration of the drug is quite low. 
So they, they, it takes several uh, pattern pushes, about three or four, before they can get to this line of analgesia. So it takes a bit of time before they can get here. So the, to avoid this, that the proponent of using vessel infusion is that you have a background infusion running around so that you do not get to this level of very low uh, blood concentrations of the analgesia. Then you need several pushes to put it up. But again, the vessel infusion, like for the, if it's given, sometimes it can also cause problems. For the last graph, the child is able to press the button. They get to the right concentration of the drug in the bladder. But then there's a background infusion, which continuously continues giving uh, the drug. Then easily they get themselves on the other side of hypoventilation. So it can also be very risky to have a basal infusion at the background. So the other uh, drugs that we use in multimodal pain management are the local anesthetic agents. These ones we are familiar with them. They block the sodium canals. They are weak bases. They are highly protein bound. And uh, the risk of toxicity is high in the less than six months old. Why? They have less protein binding. The main protein that binds uh, local anesthetic agents is alpha 2 glycoprotein. Alpha acid glycoprotein, which is low in the, the neonates and less than six months. So you might have less protein binding under so much of the free drug that can easily cause uh, uh, toxicity. So whenever you're giving local anesthetic agents in children, you need to calculate the maximum dose and beware of local anesthetic uh, 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 toxicity that can happen. Then these drugs do not work in an acidic environment, like when you're having an abscess, uh, because they get uh, ionized, and the ionized the drug does not penetrate the nerves. So local anesthetic agents mainly used as topical creams. They can be used for local infiltration, can be used for cordial epidural blocks. They can also be used for epidural blocks, for and in children, for nerve blocks as well, which can also be given as continuous nerve case infusions or just a uh, one-off uh, uh, injection. And also the other chunk of blocks like a tap block or a septal sheet block. So corner epidural blocks are the commonest blocks that we do in children. Uh, for procedures below the ambulators, they're very safe, they're very easy to perform, and they're the commonest that you find we use for children. So though most of the time we use the simple uh, one shot uh, uh, photo, uh, Block. The, we use this formula. Most of the time, we use uh, 0 0.25 rotivacaine. But uh, if you have uh, level of rotivacaine or rotivacaine, they are more recommended because they are less cardiotoxic than rotivacaine. The dosage is 0 0.5 uh, if you want to cover the sacral dermatomes. If you want to cover the lumbar dermatomes, then you can use 1 ml per kg. But if you want to push up, then you increase the volume to be able to cover the mid uh, or lower thoracic. And in this case, then you use 1.25 ml. But remember, if you give 1.25 ml, you're easily on the upper side of the toxic range. So this, you have to reduce the concentration to probably 0 0.1 to 5% if you are going to increase the volume. So the drawback of the epidural blocks is that they have a short duration of action, maybe about 4 to 6 hours. So how do we increase the uh, the duration of action, one could be to add additives, two is to uh, use catheters uh, so that you introduce a catheter from the codo, uh, if you have them, from the codo region to the lumbar or to the thoracic, where you, wherever you want to do the surgery, and then run a continuous infusion of block anesthetic agents. Or if you do, you're not, uh, you do not have the catheters, then you can use additives. One, ketamine has been shown to increase the duration of codo block, uh, but you need to have a preservative free ketamine. Clonidine has also been used to uh, increase the duration of uh, the block, but you need to use the right dose. The drawback is that if you give a very high dose, like over 10 micrograms per kg, the most optimal dose would be 1 to 1.5 mics per kg, and it's able to prolong the duration of action of uh, the, the cordial block. But if you well, we use a very high dose, then there is a risk of uh, hypotension, there is a risk of high sedation. And uh, especially in the children, that is not desirable. 
And for the last than uh, six months, we do not recommend using the additives because of the concerns of neurotoxicity. Then preser uh, preservative free morphine has also been used in, as an additive in the photo blocks uh, It also prolongs the photo blocks uh, quite well. But you need to have preservative free morphine and you need to be aware of the other uh, side effects of morphine in the photo space, uh, two writers, uh, urine detention, uh, and even uh, uh, delayed respiratory depression. So if you give morphine, then these patients need to be monitored. And even the people in the world need to know that you give morphine and you are going to have dexamethasone has also been used and another promising drug is dexamethasone. So uh, the other thing, if you're going to use the catheters for photoblocks, blocks, the biggest risk uh, of these catheters being left in place is the risk of infection. Sometimes they are carried away because of where the photo space is situated, they easily get contaminated. So epidural blocks are also used in children. They are more difficult to perform so, because, I, I, but for those who are very proficient and who are practiced enough and they're comfortable, they are very good blocks to have in children. They give better pain control, they are opioid sparing, they enhance recovery. So if you're able to do an epidural block, the better to number for thoracic. Remember in children, the epidural space is more superficial than in adults. And the guideline usually we use about one millimeter per kg of body weight to estimate the distance of the epidural space from the skin. Then the, you need to use the shorter needles and be very careful when you're doing an epidural block because the, the tissues are not as hard as for adults. You can do a continuous infusion when you have the epidural catheter in place, but remember to use a low dose and low concentration because of the risk of accumulation and toxicity is actually higher in children. You can also do the um, a patient controlled epidural anesthesia if you have a catheter in place, and this is more on the older child, especially with the uh, adolescents. Uh, Again, for local anesthesia, regional anesthesia, the contraindications are the same, like for adults. If you don't have uh, consent, you don't perform it. Uh, you don't do uh, a block. You need to talk to the parents before in the pre-operative period, and they need to be aware and seek consent and tell them about the side effects of some of these medications. Then, uh, if you have a skin infection, of course, it's a uh, it's, uh, 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 absolute contraindication. Uh, you also need to discuss with the surgeons depending on where the surgery is so that you know that how and where to put your blood. Then relative contraindication would include the coagulopathy, except this neuropathy. So there are other drugs that are used for pain control in children, the non-profit adjuncts, which we've already mentioned uh, in passing, methamphetamine, being used to prolong for the blocks, uh, duration of action, and the are also used uh, uh, to for pain control to their and also the examination has been used. So the, these drugs will enhance uh, analgesia efficacy. They are opioid sparing. They have a different mechanisms of action. Variety. You see some antidepressants, anticonvulsants, and NMDA agonists. Some act centrally, some act peripherally. But most of them are used for chronic pain, but they have increasing use for acute pain, like ketamine, has been shown to reduce the pain intensity and intensity control, reduces opioid consumption. Abacantin has also been used to prevent the return of pain from surgical pain. So if you're able to add these other items uh, as, as need be, they are also good to add for acute pain control. As we finish, I just want us to look at the procedural analgesia, which is also uh, uh, procedural pain is very common in children who are admitted. They undergo very painful procedures, especially the newly and the critically ill children. They, are, uh, they undergo IV cannulations, lumbar factors. Changes. And it's important also to give consent to them when they are having these kind of procedures. It would be before the procedure. And most of the drugs we use, depending on what is available, the IMLA for IV 
applications, the agent has been sprayed, can also be from tetanus. Sucrose has also been used from the very small ones. Sucrose, 24% are uh, being used in the neonates, in the newborn units, when they're doing this as a short uh, procedures. Its duration of action is about eight minutes, and it's an, an effective analgesic in the preterm and term infants. Beyond three months, they then seem to work well. The dose is usually about to 0 0.2 ml, but it's for short procedures, and it's, it, it works by increasing the endogenous uh, opioids in the body. So then they do not feel pain, but it's for just very mild pain. So just to the cases that we already mentioned as we finish, Case one was a two-year-old for who came for inguinohania as a day case. So uh, of note here is that this is a day case procedure. So you want to avoid uh, nausea and vomiting. And also you want to avoid blocks that are going to last very long, especially motor blockade. So this inguinohania is usually uh, mild, it gives mild pain. So the alternatives, you could choose to put, do a cord of block, you could choose to do an inguinohania block or do wound infiltration plus uh, either paracetamol or an insane. For case two, this is a six month old who, who has come for urethral implantation. This procedure gives moderate pain. You choose to have uh, like a flat scale for monitoring or assessing pain. Of note is that uh, the urethral implantation causes a lot of blood as puzzles. So you need to take that into account when you're doing your pain management. So what alternatives do you have for this case? You can choose to do an epidural or a codo and I'll give this either a single shot or as an infusion. You can do a morphine IV continuous infusion or a nurse control uh, IV infusion with morphine plus paracetamol plus an NSAID. If you're going to choose an NSAID for this particular procedure, Ketorola is preferable to all the other NSAIDs because Ketorola works on the blood as puzzles and actually controls them. If you don't have Ketorola, you could choose to give uh, clonidine onto the order uh, and this or epidural. It also controls the spasms. Then the, the third case was a five year old, a, a five day old preterm baby uh, coming in for thoracotomy or uh, trapezoophageal fistula. Our issue of concern here is prematurity. They have severe pain. This is a thoracotomy. We use the lips scale or even the flux scale to monitor or assess their pain. So what alternatives do we have in this baby? One alternative could be to do a cord block with a catheter for local anesthesia, uh, anesthesia infusion continuous. So you introduce the cord catheter all the way to the thoracic and give an infusion of uh, local, uh, local anesthetic uh, continuously. Or you could give IV morphine infusion. This will depend on whether you're extubating this child at the end of the case or not. Or a mass control analgesia morphine infusion also will depend. Are you extubating or not? If you're not extubating, this will be very good options. Then you could also add paracetamol. No NSAID because this is a preterm baby. There is risk of uh, uh, getting uh, renal dysfunction if you introduce an NSAID. So in case four, this is an eight year old with cerebral palsy, with severe cognitive impairment, coming in for femoral osteotomy. In terms of pain, the femoral osteotomy gives very severe pain. So which scale do we use? In this one, we can use the uh, device uh, flux scale for cognitively impaired children. Of notes, again, these children tend to have a lot of muscle spasms because of their cerebral palsy. And they're also at high risk of respiratory depression to, to depend on how much their cerebral palsy has impaired uh, their cognitive uh, function. So what alternatives do we have for this kind of patient? You can choose to do a continuous epidural analgesic. You could also choose a female nerve sheet or such a iliaca or lumbar plexus block. You could also choose, depending on what you have, a uh, continuous IV infusion or a nurse controlled morphine infusion. This one cannot do a PCA because they have cognitive impairment. In addition to all these alternatives, then you can add a paracetamol, add uh, an NSAID, plus diazepam. 
their data so that they can control the fastest persons. Okay, so uh, as we finish, uh, all these fancy gadgets might not be available in the uh, law of uh, media resource centers. What I want to say is that you can use what is easily available to control the children. Ensure that you optimize non-opioid and opioid analgesics as well as the other non-pharmacological methods of pain control. As you do your prescriptions, ensure that you have around the clock prescriptions. And education is important to the parents as well as to the other healthcare workers to ensure that the drugs that are prescribed are always given. But of course, for, to ensure a good and appropriate pain management with children, there's a lot of infrastructure support from the, our hospitals. You also need to be on the front line in doing pain uh, protocols, as well as uh, probably in the future have pain service systems. So, in summary, pain in children is often under recognized and under treatment. It's important to assess pain and be assessed for signs and symptoms of pain by using developmentally appropriate pain scales. By identifying the type of pain that is present, then you are able to select the appropriate treatment. Like if we identify you have neuropathic pain, then gabapentin will be a good and appropriate treatment. But whatever way you choose a multimodal approach to treat pain is always the ideal way to go. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Uh, Okonu. Uh, for that uh, quite insightful and quite comprehensive presentation, and that you tackled quite a wide topic uh, in a, such a beautiful way. Uh, probably will give you virtual applause for that and uh, for that piece of learning. Now, for the people who are wondering whether the slides will be available, yes, this uh, this presentation is recorded and um, you will be. Uh, you will, I'll tell you how we can access the, the the recording of this presentation. So. If we go to the Q&A uh, session, which I've seen there are quite a number of questions, uh, we'll have the, the sponsors of the meeting today presenting to us uh, briefly. But before we do that, uh, I recognize the fact that uh, the audience is quite multidisciplinary. And I have seen Dr. Wayego here, who is a neonatologist. Uh, Dr. Wayego, would you, in a minute or two, uh, give us a, a few insights that uh, you think uh, uh, we should know that maybe you have like sports as time is that you said we don't see. Yeah, and meet yourself and yeah. Yeah, the presentation, thank you for the opportunity. The presentation was comprehensive and um, the newborn was um, very ably represented. I wouldn't have much more to add other than to just emphasize that um, we might underutilize the, the non-pharmacologic -pharm modalities. There are quite a few. She, uh, Dr. Okono mentioned quite a few, but just to add on to the list that she had, um, we have um, things like environmental modifications. So for example, when um, performing procedures and you need to have lighting, so these lightings disturb the newborn, the neonate. So shielding the eyes, you know, those are small things that make a difference. Um, you know, stro uh, rocking and maybe not rocking, but uh, swaddling and, and just farm holding. There are small things that have been found to be effective in mild to moderate pain. Um, there is also the issue, the, the role of non-nutritive sac. Um, we, uh, Dr. Okono mentioned that uh, sucrose is useful, but even just having a baby suck onto something as a procedure is being done um, is useful. In addition to sucrose, we may not have that available, but glucose and breast milk actually does the same thing. So when you have those available, you could make use of them. The other thing that uh, for newborns, we tend to, because they won't complain, we... Um, we tend to, to one person comes, does her thing or his thing, goes back, another one comes. So if we could time and group our procedures so that 
we time them when the newborn is awake and group them so that we don't keep going and coming and inflicting pain when the baby thought that it was over. The other thing I would also mention is, uh, especially when you're thinking about um, the nurse controlled, especially post-op babies who sometimes will have medicine that also causes sedation. If you could consider use of use of um, the pain skills that have the entire you know range spectrum, and pass is one of those. It has both. Um, pain recognition and sedation recognition. So you want to have the baby somewhere in the middle. So um, one of those would be a nice thing to adopt when, especially when you're managing babies who will be on some form of medication that gives sedation. And uh, lastly, just to make everyone aware, and well, I'm sure we are, but we should be, um, also be cognizant that any baby on opioid-based management, we should be aware and look out for neonatal abstinence syndrome. It's actually commoner than we think, and it might compromise or you know, make um, complicate recovery, especially when babies have been on this sedating medication for more than 72 hours. So we should be aware and be on the lookout and manage after recognizing it. Otherwise, the presentation was very well done and comprehensive and the newborn was not forgotten. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, Dr. Ego, for that, uh, for those uh, tidbits. Now, uh, over to you, uh, uh, Dirango or Rachel from Novartis. Uh, Dr. Okon, if you could take down your presentation, then we can maybe share slides if we want to. Thank you so much, Dr. Mwiti. And uh, good evening, good evening, everyone. And also thank you so much, Dr. Nancy, for that excellent and elaborate presentation. At least we are no patient has been left behind, especially the neonates and even the pediatric patient. So my name is Rachel Musiuki. I hope I'm audible and clear enough. Yes, we can hear you and clear. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Mwiti. So I'm a medical representative from Novartis representing the neuroscience franchise. This is the division that mostly deals with pain. And we are, as we have seen from Dr. Nancy's presentation, pain still remains a major concern for our patients. And you'll find most of these patients either either the adults or even the feed, they'll all come because of pain. So for the agenda briefly today, I'll be looking at the unmet need in pain management and the benefits of using our Voltaren injection and suppositories in pain management, the dosing and conclusion. So um, as I said, pain was identified to be one of the reason why you find your patients, they'll be coming to consult you either in the outpatient or even in the, out, in the inpatient department. And uh, adapting it from this uh, large scale computer system tele survey, you find that it was identified as 40% of why patients will come to visit you. And based uh, on our settings, this 40% could even be more, could even be 50, could even be 60. And uh, from this 40%, you'll find uh, this need, uh, this patient were accessed on the adequacy of the pain medication that they are on. And from these, 36% said the pain medication that they are on there was, it was actually giving them the best. So they, they were okay, their pain were controlled and they were able to go back to their normal work as soon as possible. But from this, uh, you see 64% said the pain medication that they were in, it was not giving them adequate control. Mm -hmm. And they'll come back either for you to switch the prescription or to give an add-on for what they have been using. So you, you see this need to optimize pain management uh, in order now to get to maximize the benefits, uh, both for you as an HCP and also for your patient, uh, both either before surgery, during surgery, or even after surgery. So what then does Novartis have for these kind of patients? Uh, for moderate to severe pain management, we have Voltaren injection. That's our diclofenac sodium, 75 mg, in a 3 ml ampule. At diclofenac, uh, we apply it to be in a molecule that is has very potent analgesic effects and inflammatory and even antipyretic properties. 
But then you'll be wondering why Voltaren, uh, comparing with all those solutions that Dr. Nancy has talked about. Uh, to support this uh, need used for Voltaren, I'll briefly look at the benefits of using Voltaren over the rest. One of it being on its uh, proven analgesic effect. This was uh, is supported by a randomized double blind placebo control study that was comparing Penat 75 mg IV infusion. And here you can clearly see that uh, from 49 to 60 hours, uh, water rain injections showed superior analgesic effect when you compare it to ketoprofen uh, with less irritation at the site infusion. And also, as uh, Dr. Nancy talked on, on the multimodal approach of use of several NSA now in order to minimize the side effect of one, Voltaren also has shown superior opiate sparing effect. This is because of its still ability to control pain for your patients. This is also another study that was uh, looking, at, looking at the efficacy and safety of our diclofenac comparing it to Ketorolac after patients who had undergone uh, an orthopedic surgery. And they were looking on the ability of these molecules to reduce the need for morphine. And we can clearly see that our, our diclofenac sodium reduced the need for rescue medication. So these two, apart from all the rest, you'll see that it now gives you the confidence to use Voltaren either postoperatively or even now when you're managing your patients on moderate to severe pain. So now what happens now to that patient? You know, as a recommendation, we said we use the minimum dose possible and the shortest time possible. So for our Voltaren is indicated for a maximum of two days, but we find postoperatively there are patients uh, who are still nauseated or even they are vomiting either because of their anesthesia used or even the opioid as a side effect. Or you still this patient, they are nailed by mouth. So uh, you'll find uh, now this patient, you have to switch them to a, a more less invasive method. So from uh, you find that now the rectal route is more convenient for this kind of patient. And as, as Dr. Nancy told, said, I, you find this case now you need to use a suppository. So our Voltaren is also available as suppositories. Uh, and we have so suppositories in four strengths. We have, for your pediatric formulations, we have 12.5 mg, 25 mm -hmm. mg. And for your adult population, we have 50 mg and 100 mg. So these, uh, the reason why we have this wide variety is to ensure that the dosing is flexible to individualize it for your patient's need. So on the dosing of our, our Voltaren suppository, we recommend initially to start at 100 mg to a maximum of 150 mg a day. And in milder cases or whereby you have to use it for, for some time, we recommend 75 mg to 100 mg daily. Then what about our Voltaren injection? A Voltaren injection is indicated for adult use only, and we recommend one to a maximum of two ampules in a day, given IM deep into the gluteal muscle or given as an IV infusion. Our, we don't recommend Voltaren to be used as an IV bolus. So when, uh, during infusion, we recommend it to be diluted with 100 to 500 ml of normal saline, 0.5, or glucose, 5%, and it also requires a little bit of sodium bicarbonate buffering. And let, let it run for 30 to two hours. Then as I conclude, uh, allow me to mention on our other formulations now when you need to give a switch for your patients to the oral formulation, Voltaren is also available as a tablet. We have 100 mg Voltaren retard, then 75 mg Voltaren tablets. Still the dosing remain a maximum of 100 to 115 a day. Then for those patients who need uh, pain control and they need something that is well tolerated, we have a novel and innovator brand, Flotac. These are, these are diclofenac cholesterol in complex that offers efficacy combined with tolerability effect. It's a 75 mg capsule, still given uh, one capsule BD or one capsule OD for the maintenance therapy. So what about uh, for your pediatric patients who are still on pain? We have cataflam drops, which is our diclofenac resinate, and the dosing for a cataflam is um, one drop to a maximum of four drops a kg. For example, if, if a baby is 10 kg, we recommend you use 10 drops eight hourly. Then for the suspension, uh, it's our diclofenac free acid. 
the dosing for it is 0.25 ml to 1 ml per kg. What this means, just take the weight of the baby, use the minimum dose possible, 0.25, which is a quarter of the weight. So you divide by four to get now, whatever you'll get will be in ml, then you give eight hourly. So uh, for those patients uh, now, we call them the pretings who are neither pediatric or are they adults, we have cataflam, which is our diclofenac of potassium, 25 mg. And for those who can easily swallow the tablet, it's a small tablet for ease of swallowing for these kind of patients. We give uh, 25 mg, that is one tablet, three times a day. Now for your adult patients, we have cataflam, 50 mg, given one tablet, three times a day. What about those patients who still, they have issue with swallowing and they need a, a faster onset of action uh, of, of their pain and you don't want to do the injection again. We have a novel brand, an innovator brand, Portfast, which is still our diclofenac potassium, but in a sachet form. So because of its dynamic buffering, Portfast offers a very fast onset, onset of action. Actually, it's within the first five minutes and your patient will be free of pain. So I believe when you use all these products, your patient will be back to their normal life as soon as possible and they will be free of pain and they will now be, belong to the 64% who get, are getting effective control with their pain. So thank you so much. I'll allow in any questions at this point or clarifications or any comments of that general. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you, Rachel. Uh, we'll, we'll also take your questions uh, uh, now as we progress to the Q&A session. Uh, I must acknowledge that there are many, many, quite a number of questions in the chat and, uh, and also quite an, a number of comments. Most of them are congratulating you and appreciating, sorry, uh, Dr. Nancy for the good uh, and wonderful presentation. So the first question would, uh, there are those questions which I think have been answered in the course of the uh, presentation, so allow me not to go back to them. But any question that we not answer now, we love we love all the answers on the website, and uh, so you can visit uh, the website at some point and then get those answers. So, Dr. Okonu, the first question that that I'll throw to you is uh, from Bekan, uh, who asked that: What's special about ibuprofen among the NSAIDs that it can be considered safe after three months? So the studies that have been done on ibuprofen have actually shown that it's very safe and it doesn't cause uh, uh, renal impairment even in the very small children. Uh, it's not very clear why some NSAIDs have uh, caused more renal impairment in the smaller NSAIDs than others, but it's been thought to be probably also because remember these drugs are, are uh, uh, inhibiting prostaglandin synthesis and uh, it could be preferential uh, blockage of these uh, uh, enzymes. It's just one of the thoughts that uh, comes out, but uh, it's not very clear why uh, like ibuprofen would cause less renal impairment compared to maybe the but research has shown that actually the prophet has been given all the way even to less than three months without issues. It's been used even in PDA uh, uh, treatment, medical PDA treatment without much of an issue, but you still need to be cautious. Uh, but the reason why it is safer is just uh, it's, not, it's very difficult to explain. I don't know, that's how my eyes, maybe Dr. Wiki or Dr. Yebo. No, no, just get you to the next question. Uh, someone, uh, could you please comment on Raya syndrome? That's from Daniel. Raya syndrome has been associated with the use of uh, aspirin, methylene, and that is, but the other insights have not been really associated with Raya syndrome. So uh, that's one of the reasons uh, aspirin is stopped from being used with Sorry, sorry, we lost you. Could you repeat? No, I'm saying syndrome has mainly been associated with uh, aspirin and not yes. with the other NSAIDs. So for the other NSAIDs, they can be safely used without causing rare syndrome. It's more of, uh, associated with the aspirin use in children. 
Marine Corps asks, uh, how safe is morphine infusion in relation to intermittent administration? Probably you mentioned that in your graphs, but could you please mention the uh, answer? They are both safe. They are done well. It's just that the continuous infusion gives you a more constant concentration of the uh, drug in the uh, in, uh, drug concentration in the blood. So you don't have those ups and downs of concentration that you end up with dreadful pain. So both of them can be, if they're used well, they are safe. But uh, if you have constant pain, constant severe pain, it would be, it's more advisable to use uh, a, a constant uh, 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 infusion that have the intermittent, uh, uh, intermittent boluses, which at one point you have very high amount of uh, drug in the system. Then after a few hours, you are down again to the very little drug and you end up with uh, the child feeling pain. So for better control, the continuous infusions are better. But in terms of safety, both of them can be safe if they're done well and there's proper monitoring and follow-up of the patients. Yep. Thanks. Uh, then uh, Mepsin asks, is there a place for real-time ultrasound guidance for placement of the video characters in children? Do you use, is there a place for ultrasound? Yes, I think that is the current and the future. Uh, that is what is even recommended. It's safer to use ultrasound. It's just that it's not available in most places. That's probably maybe why it's not picked up so much. But the uh, availability of ultrasound is the limiting factor. But that is the current, that is the future. That is what is being used in and encouraged to be used and recommended to be used if you're going to put uh, uh, your uh, cutting in the child. So in the interest of time, I'll ask you only one more, and then the rest, of course, I'll, I'll have the, we'll download these questions and then answer them. And, uh, some of them require uh, very detailed answers. Can you use heavy PP packing for your combo blocks? Well, it, yes, it has been used, but there are concerns of neurotoxicity. But it has been used. I think we had this discussion some time back in a pediatric uh, anesthesia forum, and uh, our other counterparts from the other countries were uh, they were saying that's all they use and they do not have issues. So it's only as in Kenya we were saying we do not use we use the plain one. But uh, once to be guided by the pain specialist, but I know there is a bit of concern in terms of neurotoxicity but it has been used without issues. I don't know, Dr. Mwiti, what do you think? Yes, I think you could, uh, but probably you better still prefer the, the, the plain, the plain retriever care in this regard. Now, in the interest of time, because I can see you are two minutes above the, the, the scheduled time, I'll, I'll uh, humbly request you that uh, we answer the rest of the questions and then post the answers on the website. Uh, uh, and then, uh, and, 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 and that will be okay. So I'll make a few announcements and then bring down uh, this mess, uh, this uh, meeting to a close. So first of all, as I mentioned, the recording of this uh, event will be available uh, on our website and also on our YouTube and Facebook uh, pages. Then for the CPDs, uh, for the, the we shall email them to you. But then for the nurses and the clinical officers and the and, the, and our uh, colleagues from out in the country, we shall mail to you the certificates of attendance. Uh, I just need to remind you that uh, our KSA conference is uh, coming up on 15th July this year. And the theme is quite interesting and uh, uh, wonderful. Uh, the theme is research, innovation, and leadership in anesthesia and critical care. And then, uh, 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 beyond the four walls, so it should be an exciting conference for all of all of us to attend. Registration is ongoing, uh, and then uh, there are special sessions, of course, there are special interest groups, uh, and there are sessions for for people to attend. But these ones have limited uh, slots, and these slots are filling up very quickly. So you maybe you want to reserve one for yourself. Feel free to contact uh, our administrator, Shelmith, in regard to this uh, uh, to facilitate your attendance of this conference. 
uh, you can get our contacts again from the website. Too many things we can do there. So without much ado, I'll bring this meeting to a close and bye-bye. See you again.